Welcome to The Deal. This is Danny Brown, your host. We are in season six. Please like, subscribe, and leave us a comment on Apple or YouTube or anywhere you like to consume podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, etc. Each comment you leave and each like really helps our rankings, our sponsorship, etc., etc. So we'd really appreciate it. Spread the word. We're being listened to in over a hundred plus countries and all over the uh, all over the nation. So today's guest from Jackson Hole, Matt Foppel from the Graham Foppel Mendenhall team, one of the top teams in Jackson Hole. There's a reason why so many billionaires choose Jackson Hole as a home. Gorgeous scenery, Yellowstone Park, incredible privacy, some of the best amenities. Man, it's spectacular. So Matt's going to get into his story, his journey, uh, coming from a background as an engineer and then getting into real estate, and becoming his own Yellowstone man himself. School, school's in session. You can always find Matt at uh, GrahamFoppelMendenhall.com or on Instagram at GrahamFoppelMendenhall. Sit back and relax and enjoy. School is in session. Matt, welcome to The Deal. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. As I said, I, I forgot my cowboy hat uh, you know, at home, but I have a great cowboy hat. I'm a wannabe rancher. I love Yellowstone and er everything it encompasses. So welcome to the show from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, Well-known market for those that live in LA and other big cities. It's been one of the the hottest migration markets for wealthy uh, urban Americans has been for decades, but really accelerated uh, over the last uh, three or four years with COVID. But before we get into the Jackson Hole situation, why don't we you know, start with you uh, and give us a little bit of your background, where you grew up and how you even got to Jackson Hole. Sure, sure. I, uh, so I was born and raised in, in Michigan, uh, actually went through engineering school and came out of came out of school and ran a chemical factory back in Kalamazoo, Michigan, for oh about seven years. And it was a it was a New York uh, stock exchange traded parent company. And one of the things I learned in that you know do more than be just a plant manager. I needed to have some sales and marketing experience in order to kind of grow in that in that world. Uh, so I ended up moving to Detroit, working with. Uh, a colleague of mine who was in the commercial office uh, business of relocation and office furniture and design um, and that kind of thing, which uh, back uh, 20 couple of years ago uh, had me starting to lean into uh, commercial real estate there. And about the time that was happening, I uh, met my wife who was in luxury hospitality there. We got married and three months after we were married, she had an opportunity from Vail to come out and run the Snake River Lodge, which was a, a hotel they acquired here at, at the ski resort in Jackson. So we figured at that point that if we took the chance, I was in transition anyway. If we blew it and came back to Detroit in a year, nobody would miss us. And you know, 20 years later, nobody remembers us. So it's been a successful transition. Um, so so you're, from, oh, you're, from De you're from Detroit or just Michigan? Which yeah, part of West Michigan? Michigan. I've uh, spent a couple of years in Detroit and then and then moved out. And you went to Ann Arbor? You went to University of Michigan? Yep. Yeah, I went to University of Michigan, studied engineering. Uh, my wife actually went to Michigan State, studied hospitality. Oh, wow. There. You didn't and know each other then, though? No, I did not know each other until <laughs> until right before we got married. So, um, yeah, it was... Uh, you know, it all works well, except for one, one Saturday one, in October. One Saturday in October, and it's not fun in that house. Somebody's pissed off. That's right. So the big house. So you used to go to the big house wearing, uh, you know, ski clothes and mittens and, you know, playing Wisconsin in negative five degree weather and, you know, gritting oh, yeah. it out. Oh, God, that was, that's, that was a great, that's a great place to go watch a football game. So, all right. So let me just unpack before we jump into Jackson Hole Real Estate. So you were an engineering background, mechanical engineering. So I don't even really even know what that is. So that, that's machinery. What is, what, what is mechanical engineering? Tell us for us dummies in real estate, what that actually means. Mechanical is sort of a, is, is a very general, uh, you know, it's, you've got aeronautical and electrical and industrial design. Mechanical kind of covers a lot of all of it. Um, I was in plant management. We did some equipment design, um, you know, instrumentation stuff is where that job was going to progress. 
but it is a little bit of a jack of all trades in engineering. I would say the biggest thing I learned out of going through school and being in, in the profession was, you know, what you what you learned through engineering was how to solve problems. That's their entire job. And with the engineer's goal of making the job easier tomorrow than it is today, you know, through automation, efficiency, you name it. So just interesting because a lot of similarities to what we do now. Right. It's pro problem solving and solving the biggest, most complicated problems with the biggest, most complicated personalities layered on top of it with exactly. the biggest stakes in people's lives involved. <laughs> All right, so you got to Jackson Hole, you said about 20, 20 years ago or so? Yep, exactly. And so 20, 20 years ago, lay us, so kind of lay a foundation of what was Jackson Hole like you know, you were new to the area too, but what was what was the what was the vibe then? What was it like? And you know, talk to us about the beginning of starting your real estate business and what those sort of challenges were like. Sure. So Jackson, if you go way back, um, was a you know was a ranching town. It's a it's a gateway community to Yellowstone. Um, so forever, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, it was the place that you know the family would load up the family truckster drive across the country, hit the parks for the summer, and then and go home and stay at the little motor lodges in town and go to the t-shirt and rubber tomahawk shops and buy souvenirs and do that. Yeah. Um, the late 60s, the mountain resort opened and it pretty much opened with a couple of buildings at the bottom and a tram that ran to the top. And you know, they dumped you off at the top and said, have some fun. And it was, you know, it was back then, I can't imagine, it was not an easy place. Um, and as it evolved into the 80s, into the 90s, it got known as this place that was, that was, you know, extreme skiing, difficult skiing. It was not. Um, it, it's steeper than most places, so it it just has that um, attribute to it. But also evolved as a as a community, uh, you know, just with some ski hotels, and it was people that came out to really ski. There wasn't a scene at all in the winter. Okay. Uh, and then that all changed about the time that we moved in. Um, as I said, my wife came out, was running a Four Diamond Hotel. There was a new one that had just been built um, as well. So now there was this little bit of, of luxury out there. And then that following spring, about, well, 20 years ago right now, the Four Seasons opened. Um, okay. It was their first, uh, their first ski property anywhere in the world. Um, wow, I didn't here. realize that. Okay. Yeah, and what that did was took these these people that wanted to come ski uh, ski Jackson, but their whole family, you know, wasn't as proficient, uh, maybe, or didn't think they were, uh, but could come out to a Four Seasons, so it made yeah. the family vacation okay. So it opened the door to that. Uh, at the same time, the Mountain Resort did some great work in opening some more intermediate terrain. You know, I would say if you look back in the '90s and early 2000s. You know, we were, you know, if, if a typical mountain is trying to be a third, a third, a third between beginner, intermediate, and expert, we were, you know, we were probably, uh, you know, 45, 30, and 15, with 15 yeah. being the beginner or, or maybe even less. And they've opened up much, uh, they've expanded much more of the intermediate part of the mountain over the years to help that. Um, and uh, one of the things that this community has done really well is supported air, um, airlift. Uh, when we came here 20 years ago, we went to uh, Northwest Airlines pre um, pre getting bought by Delta. Went to Minneapolis, United went to Denver, and and Delta went to Salt Lake. And you can and then you you know um, took a connection from there. Now we are we go to 13 cities around the country. You know from you know Boston to Miami to Seattle to L.A. So we go everywhere on directs now and. Uh, between the four, I think the four seasons opened the door to our luxury market here, where people sure. could get in here easily. And then, uh, secondly, the airlift has been so good, and our our airport is is pretty reliable, uh, very reliable in the winter time uh, to be able to get into. Even though we have a short runway, um, it's it's accessible. It, that's a really good history lesson on real estate because I didn't realize that that was so that was so recent. You know. I, I guess so. You know, from what I understand, it's always been a hardcore mountain skiers paradise. If you're an expert skier or mountain person, for many years. But I didn't realize that the Four Seasons was only 25, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, yeah. Yeah, and so that really, of course, is going to put it on the map, and and then it makes total sense with the airlines following, 
and then the Hill evolving in terms of trying to uh, attract families and have more beginning runs because you're not bringing the kids and the family and grandma and auntie and going double black diamonds and you know <laughs> risking your life when you're when you're just a new skier so yeah, yeah that, that's a really interesting uh, evolution in history of jackson yeah. hole so okay that gets us to 20 years ago obviously over the last 20 20 plus years it's like a billionaire's paradise there's no income tax, state tax. There's huge benefits for trusts and families. It's attracted some of the wealthiest billionaires in the world. Uh, it's always attracted naturists and skiers because it's some of the most beautiful scenery and terrain in the world. Uh, we know with Yellowstone being on TV and all that backstory and history of that area, uh, kind of talk us through now what it's like uh, over the last handful of years and you know getting into the Yellowstoning of urban America and people looking for places like Aspen and Snowmass and Jackson Hole, et cetera. You are at the epicenter of that. So talk to us about what it's like now. And we can go into, I know it's a lot of questions. We can go in a lot of different directions here. Sure. Well, as I said earlier, we've always been a summer market and we continue to be, we are a stronger seller market um, or summer market, I'm sorry, a stronger summer market than we are a winter market. Oh, wow. So and, fishing and horseback riding and river rafting and hiking and biking and all that. Yeah, Grand Teton, Yellowstone, all of those national parks. Um, so that's continued to be the case. And and uh, so I think different than a lot of the mountain communities, um, that's where we are. And then we grew as a ski resort. You know, whether it's you know, it's because the business is there in the summer, but also you, global warming, you name what it is, they're all evolving their summer programming. And so we were we were kind of the inverse of that. Um, so it's been a strong summer deal forever. It's attracted, uh, you know, it's attracted you know, legacy families for a long time, but it was very quiet that way. Yeah, it was a secret. Yeah, and they, they just came out and enjoyed. Uh, and as, you know, the 2000s came along, it got it started growing in popularity as we picked up direct flights which we would do every couple of years or every year we kind of get another destination or so you know went to atlanta and we picked up the south in the in the mid 2000s okay and a lot of those guys were already in florida so the tax wasn't as big a deal but they were coming up in the summer to beat the heat and then they'd come up and ski in the winter um, you know texas was the same way because you know, they've got good tax advantages but then when we got chicago it was you know there was definitely more um, tax incentive and then we rolled to the la's and the san francisco's and the new york's and and picked them up so every time we picked up a direct flight we'd pick it up in a winter that summer people would come out in the winter then that next year we definitely saw an influx of buyers from those markets right so they got out here loved it saw it was undiscovered from a pricing perspective versus a Telluride versus an Aspen, right. um, you know, versus a Vail. So we kind of hid under that for a long time, um, you know, and and that's how we, you know, we evolved. And then as COVID kind of rolled in, we had, you know, full flights of, you know, from, or from all these destinations. And then also just had this influx of people wanting to get, as you say, the yellow, that Yellowstone effect where I can't tell you how many times and I think we would see this and a big sky would see this more than the other ski communities is pick up the phone and the client says, have you seen the show Yellowstone? <laughs> it's, it's I like, might've heard of it. I might've heard of that show. No. Well, and so, yes. What's that? So, they, <laughs> so a lot of conversations start. That's what I want. It's like, okay, do you want to be able to kill people and throw them off a, a cliff when you cross the state border? Or are you just looking for a really pretty ranch? Yeah, you just want to fly fish and ride horses. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, that that has, has done an amazing job for uh, promoting the yeah, lifestyle yeah. of the West. Yeah, and perfect storm. Very much per that. Perfect storm. Yep. So talk to me now about uh, in terms of second home buyers or in some cases, 10th home buyers. How many people, you know, what percentage, if, there, if there's a rough percentage of people in Jackson Hole are not there year round? Is it more than half? You know, I would say that we, historically we would have a percentage of people that when they call it a second home, they were out here all summer and, and you know, I, you know, October, November, December, April, May into June, somewhere warm. Yeah. And, but they were, that might be their residence here. They were six, seven, eight months 
And we would say, look, there's no redeeming quality to November here or, you know, kind of second half of April, early May, because it's either it's either just cold and brown or it's raining and snowing and then and then gives you a hint of sun and goes back to it. So, you know, the, the mud seasons or the transitional seasons, you know, people just go, but would still consider them full time. And one of the interesting things about this community is it's very much a community. Um, we are I think we are unique. I would I wouldn't be afraid to say that we have 60 percent of our workforce living in in our community not down wow. valley or out somewhere where they have to commute in. So in a year round sense, we stay very much a town, right? We don't turn into a ghost town because the ski area closed and things turn back on on July 4th. There's still your friends and your neighbors are still out and about, restaurants stay open. And that second, that retirement community still has a place. And the cool thing about the people that have come in you know, historically and picked up second homes here or became their retirement homes or whatever, uh, they come in and sit on boards on the nonprofits and they participate in the community and they really are involved with everything because they're here a significant amount of time and they care about all of those things because it is their community. And that's, that's nice. that is the, the one thing I think that really makes Jackson a special place. Yeah, that's really nice. I didn't realize that. So there's plenty of families with kids and going to schools and living there full time and you know enjoying it yep. full time. Sounds like there's a lot of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's and that is what you know what our community is. We have a uh, you know, we've been flagged as as the most philanthropic community per capita in the country. Um, we have a really interesting our community foundation and, and one uh, gentleman that's been here for a long time uh, started a what is a was a fun run and went and got and gets match money from corporate sponsors or, you know, family sponsors of you know, twenty five, fifty thousand dollars or more. And then all of the nonprofits in the Valley raise money pre this run. And then the, the match money goes and matches, basically matches 50 cents on the dollar to all these nonprofits that come in. And you know, the last nice. few years we've been raising on that race day, $20 million. Wow. Yeah. So it's wow. been an amazing impact to the community, but it's also a community event where it's the second Saturday in September when you've got 5,000 people on a three, on a 5K or a 10K walk, run, whatever, to the to the point that's really kind of funny because you'll have, you know, the <laughs> kayak club, these kids that are in the Whitewater Kayak Club will have these old kayaks cut in half and they'll be wearing them like, you know, over oh, their that's heads. That's hilarious. You know? And then the senior <laughs> center, the senior center will be out there and you'll have people pushing chairs with the afghans over their laps on the 5k walk and it's the, it's the coolest thing you've ever seen from that's, the fun. that's fun that's really cool to hear the community aspect of it so yeah. tell, talk to me i know there's been some huge high profile sales over the last decade uh, what can you t can you talk to any of can you tell us a few highlights a few massive sales so we get some context of you know what things are costing and what those properties are like sure so you've got, you know, there's a couple of areas around the valley that, that kind of hold the, the higher priced uh, properties. You know, the, the ski area, Teton Village, uh, a couple Teton, of surrounding yeah. places from there. And then you've got, there's a couple of projects that have come on and had some provenance and put some, some big houses up. Um, what we'd seen in the past was, you know, families would come in and build property, you know, build these amazing properties, but they were legacy properties. So they never traded. So right. there was never a spec market for a $15, $20 million house ever right. because we just didn't do them. People didn't sell them. They built them and kept them. They just kept them, right? And they went you know, way deeper than that, but you never knew it because they never yeah. hit the market. Um, and and people coming in had that kind of a patience and, and sort of thing. And you couldn't go put a house on the market for $20 million because the the buyer coming in that could pay it said, show me some comps and you couldn't because they just, we just didn't, didn't exist. Yeah. We did, you know, historically we would do about nine to 11 deals in our market a year over $10 million. COVID rolled in and we did, you know, basically 40, 40 deals for the two years of COVID. Wow. Each. each. Wow. So 400%. <laughs> yeah. That's good growth. <laughs> yeah. So, and then last year that, that pulled back into the, you know, the yeah. mid twenties or something. So it, you know, which is sort of normal to the market, but uh, what it did, it brought people in who could look past that, you know, we were a really small market. We would do traditionally about 700 ish deals, 750 deals in our market for the year. Okay. So it, you didn't have a ton of trades. 
But as COVID came in, you know, pricing kind of went up just because construction, you know, everything, and then and uh, and then people were actually putting homes that were bigger and, and more expensive on the market. Um, we used to say you take a $25 million listing and you know you wanted it for three years. And just because that's what it took to find yeah. that, find its place. Um, into COVID, the highest sale that had happened in this market was about 30, $31 million. And it was a resale from six, seven, six years ago or so that was at, at 18. So wow. a big jump. Doubled. Yeah, we had the we had the good fortune to to win a listing up in a project that has really probably the most you know spectacular homes that because they're all you know vintage of and people putting you know these again just building sort of legacy properties that were that were very significant had the opportunity to go and and list one of them and as we started looking at pricing he said okay you can do all the math you want <laughs> highest price has been 40 you know has been 30 on a single lot home and you know anybody's gonna nobody's gonna tell them and this thing won't appraise over 45 million dollars it just won't and but we realized there was there was there was a market and it was more special than that yeah so we're trying to get our head around how to do this right how do you price something like that <laughs> yeah and so what we did is we actually went to some some of our colleagues you know and talked to the Ty Stockton and talked to Bill Fandel in these markets and said Hey, you know, you've got this unicorn, and it's truly a unicorn, the, yep. at least per the the market. How do you go in and price, justify it, and then go, you know, justify it to your to yourself, to your seller, and then to a buyer, and and you know, got good feedback from you know from having those conversations, and went in and talked to this seller and said, we think we think we should list this at sixty five million. Yep, much they, got, they got an appraisal. You know, when we had finally had it in our contract, ultimately it appraised basically where we said it was. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. the but went at it from that angle and said, look, we believe somebody is going to get how how special this is. And we're and we're fortunate enough to sell it um, you know, in pretty quick fashion based just based on how we, we went through our release on it and timing was great and and came pretty darn close to our list price. Now what which, did that property have in terms of acreage and views and topography and so it sat up on a Butte or a kind of a small hill mountain, um, that, but it was elevated 700 feet, and right below it was the Snake River. Um, you looked down the, you, know, you looked out the property at the Snake River, flowing basically straight to the Grand Teton. Yeah, um, so spectacular. It was, it was, yeah, absolutely spectacular. One of the best lots in the valley from a view perspective. It was on 55 acres, so that acreage ran all the way down the side of the mountain <laughs> to the to the river. Um, and they had the you know one of the coolest compounds you could you could find with um, you know a, a big guest house a, a cool house then there was a spa uh, workout you know building then he had an office when underneath it he had this dining hall under it there was this cave that was cool I mean, it was really one of the coolest things you've ever seen we had a we had a buyer walk through it very early who would have been a great buyer for this property and walk through was a you know, it was a gentleman, you know, in his 60s from Chicago with, with his wife. And and he said, this is the most amazing place I've ever seen, but I think it's, I'm not cool enough for it. <laughs> Which was his, his reason not to get it. So it was it was one of those properties that just had that wow, uh, that was just so, um, you know, by double uh, the last, you know, the highest sale ever. And it really opened wow. the door for people to say, okay, if I have something special, I can, you know, there is a market and I can command, uh, I can command a premium for that. Yeah, I mean, you sometimes just can't quantify a special unique property, and right. especially in a market where no comps exist, you're making the market. You know, right. that's always, it's always the challenge. And if something is special enough and there's demand, then the market is made and that's yeah. that. So I, who are who are all these people? Can you talk about them, or is it everything NDAs and you're not allowed? Who are some? Oh, okay. It doesn't have to be your clients, but who are yes. some of these players? What is it? Celebrity, billionaire types from all over the world, or you know, we've been as we picked up the San Francisco market with with air travel, we picked up a lot of Silicon Valley, yeah, you know, tech had, guys, and then you know, crypto Dallas. guys with security. We've had um, you know, we've had you know 
30 year olds, I mean, literally, you know, <laughs> you know, driving around looking at 10 plus million dollar properties where, you know, my wife would always say, cause I'm now, she's now in the business with me or has been for, you know, for 15 years. Um, it's like, you know, I need a note from your mother before we write an offer on this house, right? Cause yeah. so young and have, you know, I've done so well in, in San Francisco. It's been amazing. Tech kids, yeah. 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 And then the, um, you know, DC is becoming an emerging market for us. You know, the really? tech world out of there, and it's and it's been interesting to follow as we saw that how much they're making an impact um, as being you know one of these hubs for you know for technology and and money for that matter um, outside of what used to just be the political world. Um, and then of course you've got your New York you know the New York uh, you know finance crowd, hedge fund finance, yeah, yeah, exactly. But then we you know like I said we're pretty big with Texas. Uh, Texas and Florida and the and the Southeast just wanting to beat the heat and and come up and enjoy enjoy great weather in the summers. Yeah, and I just know from Southern California. I know there's a lot of my clients and network and you know celebrity entertainment type moguls that have been attracted and and have bought homes up there for yeah. for uh, obvious reasons. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, been, such... it's a quieter crowd. It's it's not. It's not the scene. I think one of the things we, as we travel the mountain communities, we, I love going through them because to understand what their what their vibe is. Yeah, and you get to one, compare the details, the nuances. Yeah, and they're because they're different. It's like we don't compete with we don't compete with Aspen in the sense of oh, I want to go here or Aspen. It's like which place do you like? Because we, you know, Aspen's got this amazing nightlife and yeah, let's culture and nightlife. Cool, yeah, and we don't have that at all. And so we've got we've got our own our other thing. So it's it's not like we're competing for the same person, you know. That's where they're going to resonate to. Yeah. But it's fun to see them all, and um, and so we don't we get a quieter crowd that comes in of people that have you know no. Come in and they just want to hang out. You're going to go see them at a restaurant, and they're, they're at a table next to you, and you know they're they're doing their thing and just integrated, and and people just kind of let them you know let them do their thing, and and they're not rolling in with giant white fur coats and top hats yeah. and, you know, being so fabulous or whatever. Because uh, it's, it's it, not. It, it's much more understated yeah. in discretion and privacy. So it's complete polar opposite of kind mm -hmm. of what you would see in an Aspen. It's right. you're going there for a completely different reason. Yep. Uh, for the most part. And they're, yeah, both, and they're both great reasons. <laughs> That's what's fun about the mountains. <laughs> yeah, they're incredible. So talk to me about real estate, doing real estate there and some of the challenges having to deal with big personalities, big egos, successful people at this level. Uh, what would you say are some of the challenges you guys have faced now and just throughout the years? Mm -hmm. Well, I think coming in you, uh, you know, to the market 20 years ago, we didn't, I didn't know anybody. Wow, and, so starting from scratch. Yeah, starting from scratch in a market that doesn't do a lot of deals. So there's not this yeah. place to go pick up volume or, or jump on right. a team that does 200 deals and you can pick up 20 of them. And even if you're paying a decent bit out, you know, we just didn't have that. You're sort of on your own and uh, and trying to find your way around. And it's like, what's your niche going to be? Uh, you know, we we still have, you know, the, the ski instructor that'll have his license that'll get a deal every couple of years from a client yeah. that's, that's trying to help him out. And, and I think one of the things I, I was most frustrated with early was clients came in and say, you're looking at a multi-million dollar property and you're effectively saying, hey, I want my plumber to help me with this deal, right? You know, it's, it's, you know, so that level of expertise, I think, was something that was growing from a, you know, from a, you know, we were a bit of a cow town and, and, and we're able to do that. And one of the things we came in with was saying, we're going to, we're going to be smart about this. I mean, I could help, couldn't help doing it, being an engineer by, by background of saying, you know, I'm going to be smarter. Um, but uh, the, one of the, the, the funny ways I look back on how I got, uh, I got sort of established here was we have a, uh, you know, it was seasonal market. And in the old days, when things shut down in November, you know, a lot of the, the locals would, you know, they would go say, I'm going to take three, I'm going to take four weeks, I'm going somewhere, I'm going to St. George, Utah for, for a month. You know, hmm. if you if you owned a shop, you, you worked six, seven days a week all summer long, you're burnt out and you just go. You need a break, yeah. And so we had agents in our office that at the time that were, you know, somewhere in that less sub 10 years retirement time. And I actually went and pulled a listing presentation together and walked around the office of those people that were going away for four to six weeks and saying, here are all the things I will do for you. You know, I will take a small chunk of your deal and you can go on vacation as long as you want. Yeah. 
and it started smart. my business, you know, a third of a deal, four tenths of a deal at a time. And smart, very smart. Volume and, you know, the old adage, like I'll make it up in volume, which was, you know, <laughs> didn't make a lot of sense then, but it, uh, but it, it taught you how to do that kind of business and then make a name for yourself. And, and that was kind of how we evolved through and what that ended up getting uh, myself, you know, getting me and then, and, uh, and my wife as it, as it ended up, uh, was one of the owner partners that sold sold his business you know a couple of years prior said look we want to we want to partner with you and then you be our succession plan yeah so it became a formal partnership at that point which you know then brought us into more of the high end of the market where we were just kind of you know creeping into a little bit um brought us in there full full force and then took the way we do business added it to their merged their relationships etc and the that all happened right as the downturn started, which was, you know, incredibly frustrating, right? Because you just made this big commitment, and then there's zero business. Our Nothing happening. Lost, yeah, our market lost seventy five percent of its deal volume in two years. Yeah, it's crushing. So the, uh, but what it, but what it did is, it, you know, it got us in that arena, and it, and it let us, you know, start doing those kinds of things, uh, and and growing a team, you know, the right way. And through that downturn, it what they realized which was absolutely brilliant was, I can't buy your Rolodex. I can't buy your clients. I can, I can be, we can transition the relationship from them to me, but that takes work, right? That's a transition of relationship. It's not, hey, yeah. I'm doing this for, you know, for Bob now. It's sitting down with, you know, sitting at dinners, going to events, going to these things, taking them there. Yeah. Creating that relationship that they trust because, you know, they trust the other partner and then gradually, you know, shifting the, you know, the, the, the amount of contact until you've got the point of contact being one of us. And yeah. that took, and, and we didn't think it was going to be that, but it took five years to really have their clients make trust sense. calling us. Yeah. You got to earn the trust and build relationships over and it's yeah. not automatic. I mean, that's yeah. why in a service business, taking yeah. over someone's business doesn't mean you start with their business day one. It, fact you can do that and then get no none of the clients to come right. with you because you got to earn them and it sounds like you did yeah. uh, which is you know an attestment to the way you guys worked and also another great lesson that I, I always talk to younger not just younger agents but agents starting in the business uh, you know don't be egotistical and trying to hold on to 100 percent of the commission if you can go get 10 percent 5 percent 20 percent and be a workhorse and do the work for someone else that's how you can build a business i did a lot of that too and i know now I get a lot of uh, newer agents that like, no, they want 50-50. I'm like, no, no, go be the workhorse and take 10%. And, and then someone can go on vacation with their family and you trust you and show them that you can do it. And then they're gonna come back to you again. And you, you do 10 of those and 20 of those, that's you know, a lot of referrals. And I th that's just such a smart way to build a business if you're willing to do the work and yep. be a workhorse and that yep. you have to be. And, uh, in this business, there is no shortcuts. There's yeah. no easy way to do it. You know, no. the, the, so think, that's... Yeah, and understanding too, it's like, yeah, I'll take 20, 25% of this deal. I'll do all of these things, but I want my name on it as a, as a co, right? Because that's when all of a sudden you can say, I was a part of 30 deals last year. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you were 10% on all of them. You had 30 deals under your belt. Yeah. Now you're, now you've, you know, you're validating yourself in the market. And that's worth, you can't buy that in SEO or, you know, or Instagram yeah. followers. Yeah, there's no marketing that, that yeah. trumps putting in the work and doing the transactions yeah. and compounding referrals and relationships. So that, that's, a, that's a, an awesome lesson. So talk to me now uh, about what's going on today. Here we are, you know, end of the first quarter. It's March 28th today, 2023. Uh, interest rates have been going crazy. We had some bank issues here in California with First mm -hmm. Republic and Silicon Valley and uh, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. There's some crypto issues this year. H how has that impacted Jackson Hole? Well, I think it it's the same as probably is all of you guys in the in the metros, you know, market, you know, all the, the mountain markets all kind of had that same trend, right? About this time last year, you took, you know, inflation, the war, supply chain, uh, you know, interest rates creeping. You know, there was five, six factors that said that any one of them should have shut the market down, and it right. did. It just started. People started slowing down, um, and it continued to slow through the year to the point of the fourth quarter. Here was. A little bit anemic, and so is January, and up to about President's weekend. 
Um, then we started picking back up and felt started to feel pretty good about things. Um, the uh, you know, we're hearing from our friends like you in the in the you know metro markets that we're busy again. We've got these things going, and we always trail them, uh, trail you by a few months. So we're really I think feeling feeling uh, you know cautiously optimistic about you know being a, a good you know a pretty solid summer as you know because as you get busy, then we get busy, and we've had. Uh, an increase in activity here, even in March, uh, whether it's showings or inquiries to the, the valley, et cetera. Um, you know, being a market that has a local contingent, that's really struggled with interest rates. Um, we've had people, you know, we've got a woman on our team who bought a house a couple of years ago. You know, she locked in sub 3%, would love to buy a place that's that's 15%, worth 15% more than her house, but her mortgage payment will double to do that yeah. because, you know, rates have gone up. So it's really impacted that market a bunch. Um, the, I would say the low, the low luxury end of you know has, has probably impacted a little bit too. Where they're they're forced to put more cash down to you know at this point. But I think our counsel to that is, hey, place, right? Then make a choice when you have your best choice. Don't wait till everybody else comes back in. That one's gone, and then you're looking at things you don't like as much. Because if interest rates go down, you'll just refinance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And good. You're, good you're advice. Your, <laughs> yeah. What do they say? You marry your house and you date your bank. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you will get the one you want. Deal with it on the short. Know that rates are going to come, and then you can get back in. And then the high end of the market. Uh, I think we've seen in any you know market hiccup. There's people that dropped out of the market, but the people that are in the market are making money. Um, you know, we, you know, sold a pretty significant property that was, that was, you know, north of $40 million last year and the, and the borrower borrowed more than half. Wow. The big loan, 20 right. million plus right. loan. <laughs> right. And so you're like, wow. Okay. But the spread of what he's making, you know, when the interest rates were 2%, he might've been making six and borrowing at two and a half. Yeah. Now if he's paying six, he might be making 15. Yeah. So it's it's actually it may be more advantageous for him to be borrowing money now than it was back Interesting. then. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. The spread so, may be more advantageous. <laughs> it's crazy to think about that. But right. yeah, it's, at that level, you know, that's a whole different animal. Right, because the opportunities for them to make money right now are are right crazy, right? You're, yeah. Everybody, you know, if you have cash, you can make money on and then which whatever you want to call it down market, whether yeah. it's the stock market or you know, anything out there. So yeah, talk to me. What is the you know if we're talking luxury? What is sort of like a entry level Jackson Hole ski vacation? Oh, would it be a two bedroom condo? I mean, what, what would be a small? How what would that cost? And then I'd also like to know like what would like a typical more of a family luxury ski home summer home cost? Not the twenty, thirty, forty, but mm -hmm. sort of entry level and mid level. How about that? What does that sure. look like in cost? If you're starting uh, into a, like a ski condo and it might be a you know a building that was built in the 80s, it's been remodeled you know well at the ski area, um, maybe a hotel condo, something like that, you're probably in the you know two to two and a half million dollar range to start. Yeah. Um, we would say our luxury market uh, homes, townhouses, whatever, probably <laughs> starts at about five here, and for the most part, kind of you get to the the 80 90 percentile at about 15 million. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the five to fifteen is the bread and butter big ski uh, homes, yep. and the entry level is still going to be a couple million bucks for a condo. So very yep. similar to Aspen, and not not mm -hmm. so different in terms of just you know. Yeah, but you know, Aspen, you know, I know Stevens talked you know about four thousand dollars a foot. That's a big number for us. Yeah. That is, you know, we are if we've got stuff trading up into the three thousand dollar foot. That's a big. That's still a big number. Yeah. So the, the, that are really kind of off the charts that are trading up there. Uh, but by and large, you know, you're in the twenty five hundred dollar to three thousand dollar range, I would say, for a you know, for a house that's that may be ten, fifteen million dollars. Yep, got it. So good to know, super high end stuff, which is why it's our luxury clients are looking at these types of mm -hmm these types of areas. All right. Well, any other uh, fun stuff you can share? Are you you're a big skier, I assume? Oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm big and I ski, I always say. <laughs> <laughs> so where you go? What's your favorite runs or what's your favorite ski? Day? What's a ski ideal ski day for you? Oh, out, you know, out here, we're fortunate. Uh, 
you know, with Jackson being uh, as much, it, it has such variable terrain on it. There's some, there are runs, there's a run called the Hobacks that is, is sort of legendary around the ski area that when the snow is good, it's the most blissful place you could be and it's in bounds. Hobacks. Um, yeah, and Love you know, it. it's not an easy access. You, you either have to take, wait in line for the tram to get up or you take a couple of lifts to get over right to it. But on a day you can, you can do laps on that. It's, it's, you know, your best day ever. Awesome. And yeah. uh, how about in the summer? What's a fun thing? Are you a fly fisherman, bike rider, horseback? Yeah, we, what, what? You know, we road bike. Uh, we love to hike. Um, you know, we horseback ride. So try to try to do everything we possibly can in the summer, float the river. Um, you know, there's, just, there's not enough, there's not enough days uh, for, for that versus work in the summer because it's, you know, it is our busy season as well. So, all right. A couple quick personal fire, you know, round of questions that I always like to have for fun. Some, you know, if you're, what are your favorite, some favorite TV shows or movies? Is it Yellowstone or you guys like hate Yellowstone because it's not real? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been, uh, we've had a ball. Uh, you know, I've had a chance to meet a couple of the, you know, Taylor Sheridan and a couple of the guys in that. And, and, uh, they, they do it. They do an amazingly fun job of of the anecdotes and sort of that little peek into the life. There's so many things that are dead accurate to that world out here. Oh, and there's, you know, there's the parts that are over that, that make it fantastic. But yeah. um, a lot of the dialogue in that is 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 so spot on. So it's it is fun to watch that. Um, you know, we don't watch we don't watch sports as much out here because we're trying to go do them. And uh, and you know that's that's the. Uh, you know, that's the focus out here. Yeah. Uh, so it, any favorite books that you've read that you would recommend to people, business books or other books that have been inspirational or pro, uh, thought provoking? I tend to, uh, I end up reading books that are incredibly difficult. They're especially yeah. being an engineer, not a, not You're a, an engineer, uh, of course. Yeah. So, I, so I end up reading, you know, <laughs> biographies on, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, The Wilderness Warrior. So it's 900 awesome. pages long. I it took me three years to read it. I, I'm so bad at doing things like that. I don't. I, I wish I, I, you know, read some of that brain candy, some of those fun books. Um, but but read. Yeah, I love reading. Uh, I love reading books about the the evolution of the West and yeah, you know, the, the history. The, the book called uh, called uh, uh, Liver Eating Johnson. You know, or that's this, the true story of of Jeremiah Johnson. You probably saw the movie with Redford. But if you read the book um, about him, it was, or I'm sorry, it was uh, called Crow Killer. But um, amazing story of, of these guys and, and how, if you watch oh, The gotta... Revenant, it was very much like The Revenant more than Jeremiah Johnson, but it was about you know, the real life of Jeremiah Johnson. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to and... see how tough these guys were. I mean, we, have, we don't hold a candle yeah. to what we can do and went through. I mean, can you imagine living up in those mountains and year round with no technology, no cars, no nothing, no phone? I mean, these guys are so tough. No, and, and you, know, months er, you know, months earlier, they decide that they're gonna meet a bunch of guys somewhere. Somewhere. And they just all show up within a couple of days. <laughs> I can't even and figure it's, out. It's 200 miles from where they are. I can't even get to Palm Springs without getting lost. <laughs> All right, so if you're on a uh, bike ride or fly fishing and listening to music, what's on the playlist for you? What's some songs uh, we, we're gonna? We listen to we listen to a lot of the the Chris Stapleton, Whiskey Myers. Type oh yeah, here you know, of course sort you of, do. Yeah, I don't even know what genre it is. Sort of southern rock, not yeah. country. It's Western. all sort of it's all sort of blent together. The pop yep. rock, country, yep. southern rock thing. Awesome. Well, anything, anything else you want to share with us? Any advice to agents? Uh, any thoughts about you know Yellowstone or anything else? But it's been a blast chatting with you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, we appreciate you spending some time. I got to get up there and get some skis on or do some fly fishing. But I uh, hope to see you, talk to you soon. And I appreciate you spending, spending an hour with us. It was good to see you. You got it. Thanks, Danny. Yeah.